we haven't met, my name is Scotty James. I'm one of the pastors here. I'm delighted that you're here this Sunday with us. We have got a lot to cover. So get out your pen, your Bible, your study guide. Try to keep up. We're going to move. We're going to be efficient. I shouldn't say efficient. We're going to, we're going to sprint, all right? <laughs> uh, go to Mark chapter 10. That's where we'll be today. Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 22. If you don't have a Bible, it'll be up on the screen. Mark chapter 10, verses 17 to 22. If you're new here as a church, we've been diving into the scriptures, and we've been seeking to answer the question, what does it mean to be human? Or what does it mean to live fully in our humanity? And for the past couple weeks, we've seen how emotions are tied to our humanity. Simply put, to be human is to have emotions. To pursue an emotionless life, to attempt to be an emotionless being is to be subhuman. God didn't make you a robot. He made you a human, and humans have emotions. He created us to feel and to experience, and our emotions are what allow that to happen. And so when we talk about emotions, they're not just, again, secular psychology topics. These are intimately tied to your faith and to your soul. In fact, as we looked at last week, your emotions and your feelings are actually the window into your soul. What you desire, what's most meaningful to you, your affections, what you're afraid of, all of that is largely revealed by your emotions. And when you understand your emotions and you properly apply your emotions, it can lead towards spiritual growth. But when you misunderstand your emotions and you misinterpret and misapply your emotions, it can actually lead towards spiritual decline. You think about it, every day lives are ruined, families are ruined, relationships are ruined, Families are are destroyed all from the misunderstanding, misapplication, or misinterpretation of feelings every single day. And you don't think emotions and feelings have anything to do with spiritual matters. You're sadly mistaken. And so today we're going to continue on in our discussion, and specifically we're going to look to answer the question from a biblical framework, how should a Christian approach their emotions and approach the emotions of others? It's going to be a lot of scripture because we want to, again, build a healthy biblical framework for this. But again, how should we as Christians approach our emotions and the emotions of others? We'll start with Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 22. It says, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Why do you call me good, Jesus answered. No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments, you shall not murder, You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not give false testimony, you shall not defraud, honor your father and mother. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. Jesus looked at him and loved him. One thing you lack, he said, go sell everything you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. At this the man's face fell. He went away sad because he had great wealth. So we looked at this last week. Jesus is having a conversation with a a rich young ruler, and they're talking about spiritual matters. Specifically, how do you get to heaven? And Jesus says something, and it causes the man to become sad. The Bible says his face fell, and he went away sad. So we see emotions coming up. And what's surprising is not that Jesus said or did something that led him to be sad, What's surprising is what Jesus did after. He just left them. Right? He, he let him be sad. He didn't chase him down and say, hey, please come back. I didn't mean that. I, I, I take it back. I don't want you to feel that way. Jesus let him be sad. And so for some of us, this may feel odd. It may lead us to think, yeah, that, that seems kind of cold. Or that seems a little rude or unloving. And that's because in our society, we largely operate under the belief that my emotions are your responsibility. That's how we tend to operate. My emotions, my feelings are your responsibility. It's your job to make sure I don't get offended. My happiness is not my responsibility. My happiness is your responsibility. If you do what I want, or don't do what I don't want you to do, then I'll be happy. But if you don't do what I want, I'm not going to be happy. We don't take emotional 
accountability or accountability for our emotions all the time. Also related to that, we also in our culture operate under the belief that if something hurts my feelings, then it must be wrong and it's your job to fix it. Again, if, if, if you do something that hurts my feelings, you're wrong, you're rude, you're unloving. Think about it. Again, no one says this, but this is, these are the beliefs that we sort of operate under. Consider this. If I ask you if you like my shoes, you have one answer. Right? What do you have to say? Yeah. You can't say no. Or else, if you say no, what are you? You're rude. Or if I ask you if, if, if you like my outfit today, does my outfit look good? Just got it from, the, from Nordstrom's. What, what do you have to say? You have to, typically, you have to say yes, because that's what's courteous. That's being courteous. If you don't, that's being rude. And so we, we operate under these beliefs, and under those beliefs, then Jesus is rude. Jesus is unloving. He hurt someone's feelings, and he didn't do anything to fix it. But look what the Bible says, actually. Go back to verse 21. This is right before Jesus says something that makes the man sad. Verse 21 says, Jesus looked at him and what? He loved him. Jesus loved the man. So either we have two options. Either our culture is right and Jesus was rude and wasn't loving and the Bible's wrong, or maybe what we understand as love is somewhat off. Maybe not taking responsibility for other people's emotions is actually the right thing to do. Now, as we work through this today, I'm assuming there's going to be times when some of us are going to be somewhat violated, somewhat disturbed, and others are going to be like, yeah, finally someone's saying this. And then toward the end, things are going to switch. And people are going to say, yeah, I told you so. And the other people are going to say, yeah, I, I, I guess you were right. And so let's work through the whole time before you jump to conclusions. You might feel a little uncomfortable, but just bear with me. Let's go to Matthew chapter 15, because you never want to build a doctrine off of a single example. You want to look at what the whole breadth of Scripture says. So write down Matthew chapter 15, verse 1 to 3. We're going to see another example of Jesus behaving in a similar manner. Matthew 15, verse 1. I'm going to break this up so that we get the main parts of the, of the passage. It says, Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, And why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? Verse 7, You hypocrites! Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you. These people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. Verse 12, then the disciples came to him and asked, do you know that the Pharisees were offended when they heard this? Pause. So the Pharisees are upset because Jesus' disciples aren't conforming to rules that they made up. They had made these rules that they put on par with Scripture. And they said, hey, before you eat, you have to perform this ceremonial washing. And the disciples weren't doing that, and so the Pharisees were offended by this. And then Jesus exposes the sinfulness of their hearts, and they're even more offended. And so his disciples come to him and say, hey, you realize that the Pharisees were offended by what you said, right? And look at how Jesus responds. Look at verse 13. Jesus replied, every plant that my heavenly Father has not planted will be pulled up by the roots. Leave them. They're blind guides. You see that? Leave them. Let them be offended. Is that rude? Is that cold? Jesus is saying, it's not my responsibility to manage their emotions. They need to take that offense to God and allow him to work in them with that and bring about their transformation. I'll give you one more example. Go to John chapter 6. John chapter 6, verse 25. It says, when they had found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, talking about Jesus, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, very truly I tell you, 
You're looking for me not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate your loaves and had your fill. Let me pause so that you get some context. Jesus just fed the 5,000, and the crowds are looking for him, and they want him to perform another sign. And Jesus knows their hearts, and he's calling them out. He's saying, you guys are just, your hearts are sinful. You're not filled with faith. You got a free meal, and you're looking to have another, another free meal. And so they, they get offended by this, and they start to, to grumble amongst each other. Their feelings are unsettled. Let's give ahead to verse 60, if you don't mind. On hearing it, many of his disciples, talking about the crowd, said, this is hard teaching. Who can accept it? Aware that his disciples were grumbling about this, Jesus said to them, does this offend you? Verse 66, from this time, many of his disciples turned back and no longer followed him. So they experienced unpleasant emotions and they decide to stop following Jesus. And if you read the rest of the passage, you know what Jesus does? Let them walk. Go ahead. In fact, he turns to his other disciples and he says, do y'all want to leave too? Literally, he doesn't say y'all. He says, do you all want to leave too? And so what we're seeing here is that Jesus wasn't responsible for their emotions and their feelings. They were responsible. I want to show you a few more scriptures that touch on this because it's not just Jesus. The book of James says the same thing. Write down James chapter 1, verse 19. We looked at it last week. Dear brothers, take notice. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. Okay, anger is one of those emotions that we consider people do to us. People make us angry. Situations happen and they they make us angry. But what does James say? Does James say, make sure other people don't make you angry. They're in control of your emotions, so ask them to do things that don't make you angry. He says, be slow to anger. Who is he putting the responsibility for the emotion on? On you, on me. Be slow to anger. Write down Philippians chapter 4, verse 4. Philippians 4, verse 4. Apostle Paul, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Paul covered two emotions in that passage. What were the two emotions he, he mentioned? Anxiety and what else? Joy. Anxiety and joy. Two emotions were in there. Paul says, rejoice. It's on you to rejoice. You have the power to rejoice. We don't think that's too shocking because typically we see joy as something we're responsible for. Right? See the cup half full? Or, I mean, uh, half full? Yeah, see the cup half full. Be optimistic. So we, we, we get that. But anxiety, that's, a, that's a, an emotion certainly in our culture that happens to us. Things make us anxious. It's someone else's responsibility. What, what does Paul say? Do not be anxious. Who is he putting the responsibility on? On us. You have the power. That's your emotion. You're responsible for that emotion. So what we're seeing from these scriptures And all throughout the Bible is that we are responsible for our emotions. There's a few things when you consider like how the Christian should approach their emotions and the emotions of others. There's a few main points I want to to spot out. I don't think they're on the screen. So if you want to write them down, here's the first point about how we should relate to emotions. My emotions are my responsibility. My emotions, my feelings are my responsibility. And your emotions and your feelings are your responsibility. It's worth writing down. My emotions are my responsibility. Your emotions are your responsibility. What does that mean practically? Practically, it's my job to manage, understand, and communicate what I'm feeling. Not your job. And... It's your job to manage, to understand, to communicate what you're feeling, not my job. See, part of being spiritually mature is being emotionally mature. And emotional maturity means taking accountability and responsibility for what you feel and communicating that. And 
letting others take accountability and responsibility for what they feel and letting them communicate that. And when you don't do that, when you operate under a mindset of my emotions are someone else's responsibility, a few things start to happen. First thing that starts to happen, you start to form powerless victims. You form victim mentalities when you believe that my emotions are your responsibility. You see, if my emotions are your responsibility, now I've become a victim. I've become powerless. Now I become unhealthily codependent on you. Consider this. If my happiness is your responsibility, well, what happens if you don't want to make me happy? What happens if you don't do what I want you to do? What happens if you don't say what I want you to say? Well, now I'm stuck suffering for the rest of my life, not being happy because you own my happiness. I'm your slave now because you have power over me. I'm a, I'm a victim. What happens if you die? What happens if you never give me what I need to be happy? I'm stuck never being happy. You're powerless. You're a, a victim. Here's another thing that happens when you put your emotions on someone else or someone else puts their emotions on you. It facilitates control and manipulation. It facilitates control and manipulation when someone else is responsible for your feelings. So if it's your job for my feelings to not be hurt, guess what? My feelings now get to dictate what you do with your life. If it's your job for me not to be offended, if it's your job to manage my feelings and it's unloving for my feelings to be hurt, well, now you can't do that. You can't do anything because my feelings now take precedent over what you're doing. If you live in a system like this, whether it's a household or a business or an organization or a church where people aren't taking responsibility for their emotions, you'll find a few symptoms of this, okay? One is pouting. When people pout, that's a short tail sign that they're not taking responsibility for their emotions. Anyone ever pouted before? Okay, I've done it. Pouting. Pouting is your way of communicating, I am emotionally immature and there's something wrong, and I expect you to fix it, and I'm not telling you what it is. That is what pouting is. You don't want to say that, but that's what you're demonstrating. I'll give you another symptom of not taking emotional responsibility. Passive aggressiveness. Passive aggressiveness. Let me get a quick drink. Passive aggressive. Your makeup looks so good today. If I were you, I'd wear makeup too. <laughs> passive aggressive. What you're doing when you're passive aggressive, you're saying, I'm emotionally immature and I am too afraid to confront you with the issue, so I'm going to punish you in subtle ways. That's, that's what passive aggressiveness is. Here's another symptom, judgmentalness and blaming. Blaming people. Judging people all the time. That's a sure tell sign that someone is not willing to take emotional accountability. I'm this way because my mom never. I'm this way because my dad always. If my kids would just, then I would. If my coworkers or my boss would, then I would. You're blaming. You're not taking responsibility for your emotions and your feelings. And here's the problem with that. When you, when you don't take accountability and responsibility for your emotions, now truth becomes subjective. When my emotions are someone else's responsibility, now truth starts becoming subjective. See, if you're responsible for me not being offended, then how you relate to me isn't based on truth anymore. It's based on what I feel. My feelings have now become the standard of truth. My feelings have now become the standard of what's acceptable. Very dangerous game. Very, very dangerous game. Which leads to the next thing. When truth becomes subjective, now accountability becomes non-existent. There's no, you can't hold someone accountable to, if there's no standard of truth. If your feelings determine what's right, then I can't hold you accountable for anything. There's no standard. Which leads to the next point then. If there's no standard of truth, and there's no accountability, now there's minimal transformation. People can't grow now 
People will stay stuck in the status quo of their soul or stagnant in their faith because they're not taking accountability for anything that they're doing. What does it have to do with faith? Everything. Consider this. En- enablement, judgmental tendencies, powerless victim mentalities, subjective truth, lack of accountability, lack of transformation. Does any of that sound like God's will for his people? Not an ounce of it. Not an ounce of it. Sounds a lot like our culture, actually. Minimal transformation will happen when my emotions are someone else's responsibility. All of those characteristics prevent human flourishing. They're they're subhuman. Now, this brings up an important question. If my emotions are my responsibility, then what about the wounds that have been done to me? Anyone ever had someone do something really mean to them, egregious? Am I to fault for the wounds that and the hurts that I still have? Really big topic. I will overly simplify it. It deserves more treatment than this, but I'll, I'll overly simplify it with two things to consider. First thing to consider, you never blame the victim. So, no, you are not at fault for the wounds. People do egregious things to other humans that are real. We never minimize that pain. We never fault that person for that pain. People do mean things, and you are not at fault for that. Okay? So let's, let's first say that. However, it's also true that the power to heal you and to be made whole is not in that person. It's in the person of Christ. If you believe or you hold to the fact that my perpetrator must heal me, you are now their slave. What if they don't want to heal you? What if they die and can't give you what you need? They have power over you now. And so the rights to your healing don't belong to them. They belong to God. And you come to him for your healing. That does not mean that people can't aid or affect your healing. Certainly when somebody apologizes, it accelerates healing. When someone shows remorse, it aids in the healing. It it facilitates the healing. But they don't control or have the power over your healing. That is between you and between God. And that comes through surrender to him. So at this point... It's fair to say, looking at scripture, that it's, we are responsible for our feelings and our emotions, and other people are responsible for their feelings and their emotions. However, if we left it at that, that would be quite dangerous. Like, does that mean I have a license to do whatever I want now, and I can just say whatever I want to you, and how you feel is your deal, and you got to deal with it, and that's not my pro- No, I don't, I don't think that that's an accurate portrayal. So if we're going to talk about how we should relate to other people's emotions, we have to consider, again, the whole breadth of what Scripture says. So let's look at a few additional Scriptures to consider. Okay, write down Matthew chapter 2, verses 34 to 39. We're going to go quick here. There's several Scriptures that have a similar theme in them. Matthew 22, verse 34 should be on the screen. It says, hearing that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees and Pharisees, they got together. One of them, an expert in the law, tested him with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Hold on to that thought. Write down Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Paul says, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another Above yourselves, skip ahead to verse 15 of that passage. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. There's a sharing of emotion. There's a consideration, a, a, an, an empathy of emotion that Paul is exhorting us to. Write down Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. Paul goes on to say in this, carry each other's burdens. And, this, and in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. What's the law of Christ? To love your neighbor as yourself. So part of being human and obeying God is carrying one another's burdens. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4. Write that down. Philippians 2, 3 to 4. Do nothing out of what? Selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourself. Not looking out to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So when we start looking at what the Bible says... It is true that the Christian life is meant to be lived with a strong care 
concern and consideration for those around you. This is the essence of the faith. Selfish Christian is an oxymoron. It just isn't a thing. Though we all may be self-centered at times and selfish at times, the Christian life is largely about considering, caring for those around you. That's how the life is supposed to be lived. Let's consider things like, and this, is, this, has, this touches all aspects of life. Consider modesty for a moment. Modesty, when we talk about modesty, people usually think it's about women. It's men as well. So modesty. Whose job is it for you not to lust at me? Is it my job to make you not lust at me, or is it your job to not lust at me? It's your job. It's your job to not lust at me. However, does that give me a license to just wear whatever I want to wear and do whatever I want to do? No, you see, the spiritually mature person understands that there's a consideration for those around you. That at times you might sacrifice your personal rights for the sake of someone else. And so when I wear whatever I want to wear and I flaunt my stuff all around, I'm not considering how that might affect those around me. And so while some may say, that's legalistic to be modest, no, it's actually loving to be modest. I'm considering how my behavior is going to impact the people around me. That's the essence of the Christian life. I'll give you another example. Let's say you're raising your, your kids. Sometimes people want their kids to be themselves and to grow up and enjoy their life, which is all good. And in this mindset of them becoming themselves, they, they won't train their, their, their kids. I'm not saying I'm perfectly training my kids. So my kids act out of control sometimes. They run through the lobby. I try to get on them. Nevertheless, that's the, the. when you're so focused on your kids enjoying their experience, but not considering how their experience might be affecting the people around them, that's a sign of actual spiritual immaturity. The essence of the Christian life is to consider, to be concerned how I and what I'm doing is affecting those around me. That is the essence of love. And so this certainly translates to emotions. What I do, how I behave, what I say, I should consider and have care for how that might affect your emotions. And when you trample people's emotions and you disregard their emotions and you diminish and minimize their emotions, that is not scripturally faithful. For example, I'm scared. Someone says, I'm scared. Well, you shouldn't be. Grow up, you big baby. Or, you know, that really hurts my feelings. Well, it shouldn't hurt your feelings. Stop being so weak. You're too emotional. You're too sensitive. That type of mindset, which I've done, okay, that type of mindset is ignorant, arrogant, harmful, and needs to be repented of. I'm going to say it again. This is especially for some, it could be women too, but sometimes guys, we, we may think this way. You're being too sensitive. What you're saying is if you were more like me, things would be better. My emotions and my emotional capacity, that's the standard that everyone else should be at. And so if you would just be more like me, everything would be good. Ignorance, arrogant, harmful, needs to be repented of. Just like my emotions are your responsibility, that needs to be repented of as well. We're called to live with consideration for those around us. So we have a little conundrum here. Your emotions are your responsibility, and yet I'm supposed to live with a consideration and not intentionally harm your emotions. And so how do you, how do you marry these two things? There's three, I think, biblical principles that can guide us in not when it's appropriate to hurt people's feelings, but kind of. So these are, the, these are the, the, the principles here. When is it, I guess, okay or or? When should people's feelings not dictate what we do? Three, three things. One, we must be willing to hurt people's feelings when hurt feelings lead to their whole, wholeness. Again, your emotions don't dictate what I do when your feelings, or, or I should say, when hurt feelings will lead to your wholeness. When hurt feelings lead to your wholeness. 
write down Proverbs chapter 27, verse 6. Proverbs 27, verse 6. This is the NASB version. The Bible says, faithful are the wounds of a friend, but deceitful are the kisses of an enemy. Okay, faithful are the wounds of a friend. What does the author have in mind here? These wounds are emotional wounds. These these wounds are, are hurt feelings. Hurt feelings that come from a rebuke or maybe constructive criticism. So the Bible says that those hurt feelings are what? They're faithful. They're trustworthy. They're reliable. They're beneficial to you. They're nourishing to your soul. They don't feel good, but they are good for you. So the Bible's teaching us that sometimes hurt feelings are necessary because they can bring about our transformation, which is a good thing. Write down Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11. Hebrews 12, verse 11. The Bible says, All discipline for the moment seems to be not joyful, but sorrowful. Yet to those who have been trained by it, Afterwards, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness. No discipline seems pleasant. It's painful. Not just physically painful, but what? Emotionally painful. When you get disciplined, it it hurts your feelings. But the Bible says those hurt feelings, if humbly received, can produce righteousness in your life. And so that pain, if you let it, by God's grace, will bring about something positive in your life. This is worth writing down. Sometimes what hurts us heals us. Sometimes, not all the time, sometimes what hurts us actually will heal us. A rebuke, constructive criticism, it hurts us. But if we're humble and we receive it and submit it to the Lord, it can actually heal us. Sometimes discipline hurts us. But if we let it, it can actually heal us. Question for you. Do you love people enough to hurt them in order to heal them? Are you willing to hurt someone in love in order to heal them? Back to the parents. Parents, are you willing to hurt your child's feelings in order to heal them? Or are you so bent on controlling their emotions and sparing them of any pain that you never train them, never discipline them, never correct them, and actually stifle their spiritual growth? Are you willing to hurt your spouse, hurt your friend, give truth to them, and hurt their feelings in order to to heal them? Really consider that. Another question for you, probably even more important, are you willing to be hurt in order to be healed? That's a tough one. Are you willing to be hurt in order to be healed? I was talking to Pastor Matt about this. He was using the analogy of a knee. When people, let's let's say your knee's all busted up, you go to the doctor. The doctor says, okay, you got two options. We can give you physical therapy, it'll strengthen the knee, and it'll be functional, or you can heal it, but you're going to have to have surgery and be out nine months. Most of the time, we say, just give me the physical therapy, because we're not really interested in the full healing. We want to just be be functional, but we don't want to be whole. When you consider the soul, a lot of times we do this dance, we live in these systems where we keep ourselves where we're at. We want to be functional. We don't want to de- do the, the deep soul work, get into the, the depths of who we really are and do the surgery to our soul, so to speak, and deal with those wounds and, and come out alive and whole. We want to just stay safe, maintain the status quo of the soul, and just do that physical therapy. It's fine, but you never experience the deep layers of transformation and healing that God has for you. Sometimes you got to hurt in order to heal, are you willing to face the hurt so that God might make you more like Jesus? Something for you to meditate on this past week. But we are called to, if you would, not consider people, people, uh, people's feelings don't dictate what we do when hurt feelings will lead to their wholeness. Second one, people's feelings shouldn't dictate what we do when the truth is at stake. Write that down. When the truth is at stake, it's not about catering to people's feelings. Okay, write down 2 Timothy chapter 4. You guys with me? Okay, I don't know if you guys are offended or you're dialed in or both. 
If you're offended, that's on you. Just joking. <laughs> joking, but not really, you know. Okay, 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 4. It says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom, I give you this charge, young Timothy. Preach the word. Be prepared in a season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Listen, for the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and will turn aside to myths. So Paul is talking to a young pastor named Timothy, and he's telling him, hey, hold to the truth. Preach the truth. Don't compromise the truth. Hold fast to it. Because eventually, he's warning them, eventually people are going to be more interested in getting people around them who tell them what they want to hear, who make them feel good. They'd rather be deceived and feel good than receive the truth and maybe have their feelings hurt by it. That's the essence of what he's saying. And so for us as Christians, we are a people who have to cling to the truth, who have to stand for the truth, who can never compromise the truth, and who must always walk in the truth. And what that means is that when people's feelings might be hurt or the truth must be said, we must always speak the truth in love, in grace, but we never compromise the truth to spare someone's feelings. When you start doing that, you start compromising the essence of the gospel because the gospel is offensive if you want to be your own God. It is offensive. Jesus is the only way to heaven? So this, this, this is the, the short, simple version of the gospel. God is holy. You're not. Everyone sinned. You're separated from God. There's nothing you can do to fix that. So God, in his great love for you, sent his son to die and pay for the sin that you couldn't pay for. So that if you would surrender your life to him and put your faith in him, he would restore you, give you eternal life, and make you his son or daughter. And if you reject that, you go to hell. It's the essence of the faith. Offensive if you want to be your own God. Offensive if you want to do it your way. But not offensive to the person who cries out and says, I believe. I surrender. You can never compromise the truth for people's feelings. If their feelings are hurt by the truth, they need to take that to God. And if they would take that to God, God would reveal and unearth something in them that would bring them towards their transformation. We always speak the truth in love. Everyone say in love. In love. Because usually when people are fired up about that, speak the truth, they don't do it in love. They lack grace, usually when people are fired up about that. So we always speak the truth, but we speak it in love, with gentleness, with their best interest of mind. Third and final one to consider. People's feelings shouldn't dictate our behavior when their feelings compromise our wholeness. This is one we don't always consider. When your feelings compromise my wholeness, your feelings are going to have to be hurt. Write down Matthew chapter 16, verse 21 to 23. Again, if your feelings compromise my wholeness, then your feelings are going to have to be hurt. Matthew 16, verse 21. It says, from that time on, Jesus began to explain to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So Jesus is telling his disciples that he has to go to the cross and die for the sins of mankind. And Peter doesn't like this idea. He rebukes Jesus. I'm sure, I assume, Peter has good intentions. This is coming from a place of love. He loves Jesus, doesn't want this to happen to Jesus. So now Jesus has two choices. Do what Peter wants do what God wants. And obviously, what does Jesus do? He does what God wants. So this shows us that, yes, we consider people's feelings, but we have a greater priority. And that greater priority is to always do what we feel God is leading us to do. 
We must always seek to please God before we seek to please people. And at times, people may attach an unhealthy, maybe unreasonable emotion on your life. And when what they want compromises what you really believe God leading you to do, they're going to have to deal with that, and you're going to have to obey God above making them happy. Practical example. Daddy wants me to be a lawyer. Daddy's a lawyer. My granddad is a lawyer. Our whole family has been lawyers. And my dad wants me so bad to be a lawyer. If I don't become a lawyer, he will be so disappointed in me. But I feel the Lord leading me to be a missionary. It's what I'm passionate about. I'm gifted in this. I'm single. My life circumstances align with this. I have an opportunity. And so what should I do? Should I do what I believe God is leading me to do? Or should I make daddy proud? Daddy's going to have to be disappointed because I've got to do what I'm believing by faith the Lord is leading me to do. I'll give you another more practical example to hit home, okay? Me and my wife have been married. I'll use a female example since that was a male example. Me and my husband, right, been married for a few years. We have two little kids, and I love my family, but my, my, my husband and I are, are suffering. We don't get any time together. We don't connect anymore because every time we try to have time together, my kids whine and they cry and they need mommy. And so I, I just don't have time to go on a date with my husband or, or time to have one-on-one conversation with them because when I do, they feel sad. And I don't want my kid to feel abandoned and rejected and unloved. Well, little Timmy or little Johnny or little whoever, they're going to have to have hurt feelings. Because God has called you also to manage that relationship with your husband. Yes, you care for your kids. Yes, you love them. But at some point, they're going to have to work through those hurt feelings because by you catering to their feelings, you're neglecting the first call God has given you, which to be with your husband. I can give tons of examples of this. But the point I'm trying to show is that when other people's feelings compromise our wholeness, compromise what God has called us to do, We've got to let them have those hurt feelings. We care, but they've got to have those hurt feelings. They've got to work that out with God and allow him to bring about their transformation. So to summarize, as we close, when considering how we're supposed to approach the emotions of others and our emotions, we have a few guiding principles. One, everyone's responsible for their emotions. But two, it's also true that we're called to live with a strong consideration and care for the emotions and feelings of other people. And three, and yet all that said, all emotions and all feelings must be considered in light of the truth. The truth is always our framework through which we interpret how we should be living. So a couple questions to consider as we close. Are you taking responsibility for your feelings and emotions? Or are you blaming other people? Are you emotionally accountable or not? Consider that this week. Second thing to consider Are you living with the consideration for how you're making other people feel? Are you considering how your behaviors impact those around you? Consider that this week. And the third thing is, is the truth your guide in all matters? Or are your feelings the standard of truth? Are feelings what determine what you do and and don't do? We're called to love God and love our neighbor as ourself. And how we deal with emotions is central to that. So let's reflect upon these things, and by God's grace, may he transform us that we might love our neighbor as ourself and be emotionally accountable and considerate of those around us. Amen? Amen. Got a lot to pray about this week, so let's let's do it. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for your word and the guidance and direction you give us in it. Thank you for creating us with emotions and feelings. They're beautiful. They're what make us human. And yet, we don't always know how to manage them. We don't. So we confess that and we ask for grace. Please help us become more and more emotionally responsible to not depend or, or to not expect other people to to manage our emotions, but for us to be accountable for that and responsible for that. 
And yet may we also always operate in love and be considerate and show care and concern for the feelings of those around us and never seek to, to harm our neighbor emotionally. And yet also may the truth always be our guide. This is a complex thing, so give us the grace and discernment to manage this well, also that we might fulfill the second greatest commandment, which is to love our neighbor as ourself. Please, God, produce these things in us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said together? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and give God some praise before we leave.